Well, I guess I'll just have to stick with Nick. Oh, wait a minute. You're not. You guys aren't. What? Sleeping together. Sorry, I thought that was implicit in my disgust. Uh, uh, explicit, actually. And no, I have a very strict rule against dating couples. Oh, really? I call it the strange policy. Oh, well, good. I'm glad something's named after me. Benedict Cumberbatch was always our first choice. There was a brief moment where it looks like it looked like schedule wasn't going to work out. He actually had committed to do Hamlet in London. Uh, and as such, it wasn't going to work out. We had a date to make. We had a date we had to start shooting. Uh, uh, the release date was staring us in the face on the calendar. And we sort of parted ways and said, I, I guess it's not going to work out. We came back to, the, to, we approached him again and said, how can we make this work? Can we push the release date? Can we do this? Can we start later? And miraculously, he really wanted to do it. We really wanted him to be in the, in the movie. Um, and we ended up sliding our release date back about six months to November to accommodate him. Uh, thank, thank God he's perfect to, for this part. And he's a very busy man. So we essentially did Hamlet, which is incredibly physically taxing, for about six weeks. I got the chance to see it. It was amazing while I was there in London. And basically wrapped that production and was on a plane with us to Nepal days later. So his schedule was jam-packed. And he rolled right into this huge movie, 90-day shoot, right after being in Hamlet. So uh, uh, we're grateful for his work ethic, for sure. I'm talking tonight at a neurological society there. Come with me. Another speaking engagement? So romantic. You still love coming to those things with me. We had fun together. No, you had fun. They weren't about us, they were about you. Not only about me. Stephen, everything is about you. Rachel, we knew we needed someone just as smart and just as capable as Benedict. Uh, she plays Dr. Christine Palmer. She is very much a peer to Stephen Strange. She's just as capable as he is in a different type of medicine. They sort of specialize in different areas. And we knew we needed someone that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Strange's intellect and arrogance, right? He sort of brings those in both, in the early part of the film, he brings those both in equal measure. And you needed someone that had the toughness, the intellectual toughness and the emotional toughness to not be walked all over by him, uh, or else the audience would totally divorce themselves of this character and not like him. We needed someone sort of fighting back against all that. And Rachel brings that uh, in, in great measure, but also has a wonderful softness to her and a wonderful uh, side that draws you in. In a lot of ways, she's the humanity of the first part of this film. You're a man looking at the world through a keyhole. And you spent your whole life trying to widen that keyhole, to see more, to know more. And now, on hearing that it can be widened in ways you can't imagine, you reject the possibility. No, I reject it because I do not believe in fairy tales about chakras or energy or the power of belief. There is no such thing as spirit. One of the things that's hugely important to us is to make sure that the films stay fresh uh, so that there's always a reason to come back to the theater to see them. Even within the sequels to the films we've already established, how can you take left terms even within a franchise? And one of the best ways to do that is to kick open whole new doors uh, into different parts of the Marvel Universe. Doctor Strange was an opportunity to kick down the door to magic, to other dimensions, to this whole side of the universe that we haven't seen yet. We've seen space in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy and a little bit in Thor. We've seen very much grounded uh, uh, tech-based universes like in Iron Man and the Avengers. Uh, we hadn't seen magic. We hadn't sort of gone there yet with the occult and spells and this sort of hidden world just beyond our reality. So just approaching it like that felt like there's really an opportunity here to tell a different story um, within the Marvel Universe. What did you just do to me? I pushed your astral form out of your physical form. What's in that tea? Psilocybin, LSD? It's just tea. With a little honey. Stephen Strange in the comics has always had one of the, the absolute strongest origin stories. And being how this is our later release for us in the MCU, we did talk seriously about whether or not we should do a straight origin story if the world was ready for more origin stories. And after a lot of soul searching and thought, we decided that to know this character, to understand him, we had to tell the origin story right. And it's also just a fascinating origin story in its own regard. So the notion of telling the story of a man at the top of his game as a scientist, as a surgeon, has all that taken away in a car wreck, and then has to claw, crawl, crawl back, claw his way back to uh, 
to being a new person, that is sort of inherent to the DNA of who Stephen Strange is, going back to his earliest comic incarnations. So we wanted to stick pretty close to that in this version of it. Um, because magic is such a weird world and such a big ask for the audience to buy, we had to go on that journey with Stephen Strange as he discovered all that just so we could set this whole world up. Scott Derrickson was the perfect choice to direct this film, uh, not the least of which reasons was because he loved the character. He grew up with the character. It was his favorite character uh, as a kid. Um, but really, we very quickly, under in all those early meetings I had with Scott, came to a meeting of the minds. We, were, we knew the movie we wanted to make, and it was the same film, which is essentially about the journey of a character, right? The journey of a guy who goes from being a hardliner, an empiricist, a scientist who, if he can't see it, smell it, touch it, it doesn't exist, it's not real, who is then forced to have this change of heart and become a man, uh, a man of faith, a man who has to believe in things that necessarily you can't see. Um, and Scott very quickly sort of understood that and got that character based on a lot of the interests in his own life. You know, Scott is a deep thinker about a lot of things. He studied philosophy, he studied theology, he studied science, and all those things sort of have to come together to understand who this character is and the journey he goes on. <laughs> 